I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hi everyone and welcome to 2024 for TGU from VLGA Connect. It's great to be back with you after a long break, but I think a deserved break for Tony Rownick and Julie Reed, who are with me now. Julie, hello. Nice to see your smiling face. Hi, Chris. Yeah, it's great to see you guys again. I really missed you over the summer. You know, it's it's great to get together and just talk about all the latest hot topics. Um, and whilst I've been keeping an eye on things that are going on, um, in a sort of small way, I suppose, it's not quite the same as engaging with uh, you and our listeners on uh, what is really important. But, yeah, I've managed to have a nice break. Um, went down to the beautiful Inverloch um, and up to Hillsville for a bit of a break over summer, which has been um, lovely. Lovely to hear. And of course, as you say, there's been a lot happening. We've got a lot to talk about. Have you been keeping abreast of developments on your break, Tony? Absolutely. Look, it doesn't stop, does it, Chris and Julie? It keeps keeps happening coming in. So I did, did a bit of a, a grand tour of uh, Victorian municipalities visiting the relatives over Christmas. So that was nice. <laughs> but uh, yes, it's just uh, really steadily been flowing in and lots to talk about, particularly in the, in, the, in the month of January, just gone. Lots of announcements, lots of happenings. Absolutely. So, well, let's get into it. I know people are ready to to hear what's been happening around the place as things really gear up for what's going to be a massive year. I know we always say this, but but truly, we've got uh, council elections coming up in October, of course. We've got the new conduct reforms that were flagged by the local government minister, Melissa Horn late last year at a VLGA fast track event. In fact, uh, now the consultation paper for those reforms, Julie, Tony, you may or may not have seen these yet. They've been circulated this week, as I understand it, to councils and uh, the uh, LGV is looking for feedback from councillors and CEOs and the peak bodies on these. At a high level, uh, Tony, I, I think you have seen yep. some of what's uh, proposed. How earth shattering would you say it's going to be? Uh, look, look, I think... N- n- no, no major surprises. It's a direction yeah. that we 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 uh, anticipated um, the reforms w- would go um, um, around, you know, sanctions and and I guess that swing back towards um, a more standardised approach with governance rules, codes of conduct, etc., across the sector, rather than um, you know the variety, the individualism that we we had seen, but. Um, yeah, it, it's. Uh, I don't think there's anything earth shattering for people, but I think it will um, have a significant impact mm. on the way um, we view that sort of code of conduct space going forward. Mm. So um, we can't yet go into a lot of detail. We will at some point, other than to say that uh, from my first scan of this, there are three key reform areas around strengthening council leadership, capability and council of conduct, uh, improving early intervention and effective dispute resolution. I don't think any would argue that that isn't necessary when you look at mm. some some cases that have taken, you know, one CEO told me 14 months from the matter sort of starting to getting some sort of an outcome. And then it's arguable whether you've actually got an outcome at the end and reforms to strengthen oversight mechanisms. P- perhaps the most controversial thing here, Julie and Tony, first off, is there's just a four week consultation period. The uh, the state mm-hmm. is looking for feedback by the 29th of February before these get introduced to the parliament and the peaks are saying VLGA particularly and VLGA and LG pro that that's not long enough. They'd prefer probably eight weeks for some meaningful engagement on this. Does that sound fair? Yeah, Yeah. I think so. I think so, Chris, I think four weeks is really, really short in a, in any council, um, you know, consultation period, uh, especially when there's a number of people to talk to, including talking to councillors for those uh, CEOs. So, um, yeah, I, I think, and, and for the peaks to get their head around, uh, you know, where councils are at in terms of their position on these matters um, in really, really important issues that they're facing. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would have said double 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 the amount of consultation period. All right. Well, that's certainly what's being called for, whether there's a response uh, to that, I guess we're yet to see. But what I can tell you is the VLGA is convening a meeting 
of members to inform a VLGA submission on this uh, paper. That'll be via the Governance Advisory Network of Mayors, Councillor Delegates and Officers. That'll be an opportunity to sort of workshop what's in there, hear an overview of the reforms and provide uh, perspectives that will then be collated into a VLGA submission. But of course, uh, I think all councils, uh, perhaps even individual council laws, uh, uh, should be encouraged to to read it themselves and make their own submissions to this. Okay, um, we might just park that one and come back when we can talk in a bit more detail about what's in those reforms, because I'm sure there'll be quite some detail in there. But uh, on a related matter, we've had yet another um, appointment of municipal monitors to a Victorian council. I've lost count, 10, 11 maybe uh, in this term. Uh, it's Mooney Valley this time around. Philip Carruthers was appointed uh, with immediate effect this week to, to go into Mooney Valley. And there's one more monitor yet to come. Tony, Julie, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but I've been saying this for a while. The more we get the appointment of monitors and and uh, administrators, et cetera, the more you wonder where the qualified people for these are going to come from. But it looks like the state's working on that. That's right, Chris. They've uh, put out an EOI um, to call for people to do these kind of jobs, so like monitors and administrators, which is a fantastic approach from the government to put that out broadly and to try and get um, some qualified people in those particular roles. So I believe that closes, I think I saw it closed at the end of February, closes at the end of February. So uh, those of you out there that might be interested, you might want to um, have a look at uh, the website and um, have a think about whether or not uh, you think you can add some value in this space. Yes, it's on the LGV website. It sets out some prerequisites for the sorts of experience uh, yeah. that, that's required. They're looking for a four-year commitment. So one would assume yeah. that's going to time in with the next term of council because, of course, as we said, we've got elections coming up in October. So if you're interested, uh, check that out and make sure you get your uh, application in. But Tony, monitors again at Mooney Valley this time. Uh, not a lot being said about why, other than the appointment being welcomed by the mayor there, Pierce Tyson, but you've had a look at the terms of reference, which gives us some hints. Yeah, it does, I think. It's, I think once we look beyond the typical sort of monitoring governance functions language, um, there's explicit language around um, councillors needing to understand their their role, including the confidentiality, confidentiality requirements of their role and the management of conflicts of interest. And I think that might maybe a little bit of a hint at some of the concerns that led to the appointment. Also, I think uh, the terms of reference um, um, also refer to the processes around the CEO's um, employment and um, remuneration policies and practices, et cetera. So that may be a little hint um, towards the mm -hmm. governance issues being contemplated. Um, the other thing that struck me was it seems like we're now um, fixed in this um, approach of appointing two rather than one monitor, and um, that seems to be the path going forwards that uh, the minister's um, adopting, whether it's to share the load um, around to make it less um, you know, stressful on the individual monitor. I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah. Uh, look, it makes sense. Two heads are better than yeah. one, I guess, in most mm. cases, aren't they? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I, I think that, you know, having those maybe two different different uh, people with different skills um, to bring to the table to be able to work through issues together, I think is a really good idea. And um, you can't always find people that have that can put in the time as well um, that they ask for. But anyway, look, interesting. The thing that I observed with this one, Chris, was they also mentioned about the relationships between counsellors between councillors and council staff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of a lot of the monitors that go in are looking at things like relationships, and we know how important relationships are in local government. Um, so, uh, yeah, in, interesting. Doesn't give as much, but it gives us a bit of a hint of some of the, the challenges that they might be having out there. Yeah, and we should know this is on the back of, isn't it, the, the IBAC's interest um, um, in 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 the council back in what September of 2023, when I yeah. think that there was some phones seized from about four or so councillors, um, an investigation into you know their relationship with the local soccer club. Um, we don't know the outcome of that investigation. We certainly there hasn't been any um, um, indication of IBAC proceeding or, or, or recommending any charges or that, but presumably 
some of um, that context is what's being considered in the appointment of the monitor as well. Mm. I'm sure that's right, Tony. There's been no direct link made mm. to that case, but it's been mm. uh, publicly reported as well as the a bit of a sequel with one of those councillors to appear in court next month, I think in March, on uh, drug possession charges. So allegations of uh, drug-related activity that have arisen from that search that was conducted as part of the IBAC investigation last year. I just want to focus a little bit on the mayor's response to this. Uh, mayor Pierce Tyson at Mooney Valley, uh, a very positive response. He's welcomed the appointment of the two monitors and made the following comment. As the Victorian government undergoes possible reforms to the Local Government Act regarding individual accountability for elected officials, I trust Mooney Valley will serve as an important case study in professional and positive practices. We can probably read a bit into those words, which I'm sure were chosen mm. very carefully. Yeah. And yes. look, Chris, I've had some intersection with Mooney Valley and they're doing some great work out there. So, you know, we, we can't forget about, you know, the um, the terrific um, work that the organisation are doing um, in preparation for what is going to be a very, very busy time over the next um, year and a half in particular for councils um, pre and post the election. So, yeah. All right, so we await news on the second monitor to be appointed. Uh, I haven't heard anything out of Glenelg where uh, Jim Gifford and uh, Stephen King Kingshot were appointed as dual monitors last year. One assumes that work's uh, going on. There's been a bit happening at Glenelg, such as a uh, an amendment to their um, governance rules, uh, which uh, had some proposed changes that they've backed down on because of overwhelming public feedback, mainly about community question time. So I'm sure the monitors have been observing those processes uh, playing out there. Uh, conduct matters never too far away from the headlines. We've got a new case to talk about. Before we do that, a bit of a sequel to the one we spoke about late last year when Jasmine Hill, the councillor at Wyndham, was found guilty of serious misconduct and suspended for, I think it was four months, Tony, uh, that suspension started in December, but Councillor Hill had um, a stay from VCAT granted in January, pending a further hearing on that matter. And she's back at work at uh, Wyndham in the interim. I understand it'll be June before the matter comes back to VCAT. So again, here's another example of a matter that just drags on and mm. on and on, which is not to the benefit of anybody. Yeah, so so that that stay of the sanction is part of that usual process where there's an mm. appeal, of course. But um, again, I mean this this um, um, issue of uh, potential VCAT appeals from code of conduct decisions, I think, may, may well be something that this code of conduct um, framework uh, uh, um, amendments that are being considered might might address as well. Are you suggesting, Tony, that the reforms will reduce an avenue for appeal of these matters to VCAT? Good wow. I or think. remove, rather? Yeah. Yeah, at least limit. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm. Uh, we'll wait to see on that one. But uh, there's a case at Darabin that's got some attention in the media this week. This is a finding of misconduct on six allegations against Councillor Emily Dimitriadis. Um, the the age, as you were saying to me before, Tony, went pretty heavy on the link to the voice referendum and a particular council meeting. But there's some deeper issues in this one, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, I I, I, I understand that the focus of that article, but I think for councillors and council staff, ring it's a little bit misleading as this arbiter decision goes to much more than you know that decision on the voice. It's about really the application of that treatment of others standard in the standards mm -hmm. of conduct. So a um, number of allegations here and a number of findings of misconduct against Councillor Dimitriadis. Um, one allegation involved her um, entry into a private function room area at the rear of the council chamber for the second time at a council meeting in July last year after having been told by the CEO that there's a private meeting going on in there between the two chairs of the Darabin Aboriginal Advisory Committee, being the mayor and um, you know a, a, a member of the public who was a chair, and um, and the finding was that um, that Councillor Dimitriadis's you know entry into that room 
having been told there's a private meeting occurring there. That showed a lack of um, respect for the mayor and the co-chair, um, showed a lack of care for the health and safety of those individuals. And importantly, um, Councillor Dimit Dimitriadis's you know, discourteous protests on being asked to leave were found to be disrespectful of the CEO. And importantly, you know, the arbiter noted those um, protests were made in front of multiple staff members. Um, there was also a finding um, in relation to a conversation Councillor Dimitriadis had with the CEO in the council chamber where she spoke in a, you know, raised and angry voice um, opening inverted commas, telling the CEO off was the comment from the arbiter in a public council meeting, again in front of um, nearby staff that also was found to be misconduct. And, and generally the questioning of Councillor Dimitriadis at that meeting, the public questioning um, directed towards that advisory committee was found to be disrespectful of the advisory committee, creating a sort of a, an unsafe atmosphere for them. And that, um, that her line of inquiry, which was about a perceived lack of consultation of the Darabin Aboriginal Advisory Committee um, about their recommendation for council to take a neutral position on the voice referendum, that um, line of inquiry ought to have been conducted through more appropriate Council channels, not in a public fashion, was the um, arbiter's finding. There are also findings in relation to um, comments during public debate on other items. So um, there was um, that night there was a, an item about the removal of three trees in Northcote um, and an officer recommendation for their removal due to electrical safety requirements. Um, Councillor Dimitriadis in her debate, used the word nonsensical, describing the officer recommendation and said, Darabin's rushing in chainsaw first in commenting on the officer report. And again, the finding was that um, Councillor Dimitriadis could reasonably be interpreted as being disparaging of those council officers and uh, Energy Safety Victoria. And that was um, amounted to a breach of those, uh, that standard around treatment of others. Um, also, social media. Wow, wow. We're mm. having social Once media yeah. um, <laughs> appearing in these um, um, conduct matters. Um, various Facebook and LinkedIn posts by Councillor Dimitriadis claiming that she'd had to return from maternity leave early because um, Council had brought forward important decisions unnecessarily. Um, and the finding of the arbiter was... Um, that the posts could reasonably be interpreted as saying that council, um, including council staff, had brought forward decisions as a result of Councillor Dimitriadis having given birth and being away on leave. And the arbiter found that there was no evidence of any sort of concerted or deliberate action by the council to you know, schedule items in mm. Councillor Dimitriadis's absence. And that Language in posts like this, and I quote, um, so if this is a media post, the importance of councillor officers being honest and transparent with councillors. So that was the post. Um, that implies that council staff haven't in the past always been honest. And so mm. it's disrespectful and casts doubt on staff's integrity. And finally, and sorry, I know there's a lot here, but finally a post on the Darabin residence group Facebook page about the replacement of lights at a council um, op, um, managed car park. Councillor Dimitriadis said in that post that, you know, council's response to this a light that had been destroyed in an accident was lacklustre. Um, and that, you know, it was a slow response to the replacement of the damaged like light. And she then liked a comment that said, the council was dangerous. And oh. again, the, the arbiter said that, you know, firstly, those posts were clearly um, made in the role of Council Dimitriadis as a councillor. She's communicating to the public about a matter before council, a decision for council about the replacement of a light. And the posts cast doubt on council's 
ability to undertake its core business and address safety concerns in a timely way. So it's all about, I think, um, about the right forum for councillors to use for um, making um, comments or asking questions where they have concerns about um, um, the material contained in officer recommendations, reports, or or what officers are doing in relation to a particular issue. And generally, um, it's it's appropriate that those concerns are raised in a um, direct, more private fashion, rather than being aired, aired, aired first publicly. And I look, I think there's a challenge here um, for councillors. I think we can sometimes be overly sensitive about criticism of council staff by councillors, but here, um, I think the comments here were the, the choice of, of, of forum, choosing to make those comments in a public way, social media, at public meetings, in front of council staff members, um, was, was, but according to the Arbiter decision, was inappropriate and there's a better channel for councillors to pursue in these instances. Tony, this uh, this arbiter decision calls back on a previous arbiter decision that another council around that issue of whether a councillor acting on their private social media is seen to be acting as a councillor, didn't it? Yeah, and 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 look, look, I think it's important here that um, councillor Dimitriadis referred to her position as a councillor in some of these posts. Um, and clearly, um, but but councillors, even who don't do that, need to be aware that when they're making comments publicly on council matters, it will generally be seen as them act acting in that role of councillor. Mm. And quite um, significant sanctions here. Um, unreserved vo verbal apologies ordered in relation to, you know, apologies to the those Aboriginal Advisory Committee members a verbal apology to the CEO, a verbal apology to council staff, all to be made at the next council meeting, written apologies required on those social media platforms, plus the one-month suspension, plus having to undergo, you know, appropriate training. So I think it's a kind of a, a sense of the approach arbiters um, councillor conduct panels are likely to take in relation to this treatment of others standard moving mm -hmm. forward. And I do think that there's perhaps been um, um, a, a move in the interpretation of this standard. And I wonder whether in that first year of the term it would have been interpreted so, you know, um, in such a way. But I think clearly the, con the in the context of the concern about um, the environment that councillors and council staff are operating in and that poor conduct we're seeing sometimes, we're going to see um, sanctions like this moving forward and interpretations like this moving forward. And councillors just have to be conscious of choosing the right forum to um, have that rightful say that they have, have that uh, ask those questions and uh, you know, perform that questioning role that they have in relation to the expert advice that they're receiving. Mm. Tony, I noticed that the arbiter strongly suggested that the councillor remove those social media posts, but noted that she had no power to actually direct the removal of those posts. Yeah, and I'm not sure what the latest is in terms of have they have they been removed, but that that's right. That that certainly um the arbiter doesn't have that power. Mm currently so that report was to be tabled i think last night at a darabin council meeting i haven't had a chance to look at that meeting so i'm not sure uh, if anything further has transpired but the age article noted that uh, the councillor had said she would provide those apologies so i'm assuming that's occurred does that occur at the same meeting it's tabled or does it occur at the next meeting that the councillor attends given that there'd be a one month suspension kicking in as of today i would think yeah I, i'm i'm not frankly certain of that the answer to that but um um i i think we'll, we'll all be watching that yeah record of that we'll meeting thing what happened last <laughs> night uh if, if we're not told a anything mm -hmm. to add on that julie i think that's been a great summary there from tony it has been a great summary um it, it, it i think it is really interesting to reflect on now the number of cases that we've got coming forward and what what that definition um, is 
is now around, you know, that um, treatment of others, um, I think that really helps in discussing this issue with counsellors because now we've got some patterns of, well, these are the types of things that are not appropriate. Um, so it, it's helping to define it for the counsellors um, in their in their work. So mm. I, I think it's really helpful um, and it's good that it's in the public domain so everybody can see what's going on. I think um, yeah. I've really... Um, I think valued getting that kind of information coming forward and understanding and sharing the learnings um, across the sector. Okay, so that report is online. There's a bit in it. I think it's about sixty pages. Uh, yeah, Tony. sixty the pages one that I've seen. Yeah, there were about twenty five or so witness statements. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So okay. a lot of work there. Yeah. All right, knock yourself out if you want to have a read of that for yourself. Uh, big news at CEO level this week or last week, it might have been. Brett Davis has announced that he's uh, leaving Moyneshire Council for the cross-border commissioner role, which is uh, part of the state uh, government. And Peter Brown uh, has popped up again, former CEO of Horsham and uh, help me Ole. here, Ole. 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 Um, and I think he's been helping out in an acting director role in uh, recent times at Moyne as well so he's yes. been appointed yeah. as an acting for three months or so depending on how long it takes to recruit the new ceo but interesting move julie for for brett to be going across to this cross-border commissioner role which a lot of people didn't know yeah. existed i think until covid when uh, luke wilson popped up in that role uh playing very significant role in cross-border relationships that's right yeah uh, he um he and this particular role, the cross-border commissioner, deals with emergency situations and obviously has that really strong relationship with all of the border councils in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. So, um, yeah, it was, it was sad to see Luke uh, leave. He's been there for a while and uh, obviously made a great contribution. I had a little bit of intersection with Luke uh, when I worked at LGV um and certainly he was great in those emergency situations getting information out to the departments about what was going on um you know particularly the you know as you said the covid and the and and the floods etc mm. that happened um so it is actually part of regional development victoria um and um phil curry was actually acting in the role and i think brett's about to start so uh, i know brett's finished up now at moyne i'm pretty sure um but uh, there's, there's quite a breadth and depth of um, work that the commissioner does. Uh, it gets involved in regional jobs, in investment and trade. It gets involved in um, infrastructure, business development, and obviously emergencies. But some of the hot topics from what I could see were um, there seems to be some border health care planning going on. Uh, for the communities um, on those those uh, in those border locations, um, and there's some issues around border policing and justice. So again, it's about looking at that um, connecting those those issues together across the boundaries. And um, you know, I think Brett is Brett is a really good operator and has a lot of contacts. Um, he's very well networked and obviously has worked across Victoria before and comes with a really strong planning background. And I think any any planner uh, would um, grasp hold of these types of issues, I think, really well. So great appointment, really pleased for Brett. Um, I think it was really hard for him to leave Moyne because it's a lovely mm. place down there um, and, um, you know, probably a very, very tough decision for Brett, but, you know, a great opportunity for him going forward to really make a difference to those border towns. Absolutely. So uh, well done and, and for what you've done at Moyne there, Brett, and uh, good luck in uh, the new role. I think Peter Brown takes over on the 19th of February. Uh, Brett might be having some, some time off before he takes up his new role. Is he Julie? Sounds like he's already... Uh, maybe. I'm not yeah, sure. Maybe. Right. Yeah, maybe. So uh, on the list of uh, CEO positions to be uh, resolved, I've got Moyne, East Gippsland and Glenelg at the moment, just for those who are keeping score, because I know a few of you do. 
what else would we like to talk about, folks? There's no shortage of stuff on the list here. Um, just in passing, there's a story out last week in the Bass Coast Post looking at the voting history of a Bass Coast councillor, a councillor there who, by the report, seems to make a habit of abstaining on some some key decisions. Now, we know an, abstain, an abstention is a no vote, effectively, isn't it, Tony? Yeah, that's right. So under Section 61 of the, the Local Government Act, yeah, so the, for the purposes of determining the result of a vote, a councillor who's present, who they say doesn't vote, uh, is taken to have voted against. So by implication, I guess you can abstain, but um, yeah, it's taken as a no vote. Um, generally, I'm not a fan of abstentions, mm -hmm. uh, Julian, Chris. I um, generally mm -hmm. think... Um, we're there to, as councillors, to you know, stand up a, a, either in favour or or against. But there are sometimes, I think, extraordinary circumstances where maybe a councillor wasn't present during some key briefings or meetings and feels not significant, uh, not sufficiently informed. In this case, I think, according to the article, at least, the councillor, it's councillor Les Lark, they were referring to. Um, he, he abstained twice in a de, in the December meeting, um, but on two different matters. Um, one was about an application for funding for um, the Dinosaur Trail at Bass Coast, an um, yeah. application of the Growing Regions Fund. Another was about um, amending council's investment po policy to divest out of banks that fund fossil fuel projects. Now, he abstained in both cases, but apparently didn't provide any explanation for his That's abstention, right. didn't mm. speak at all on the motion. So I guess um, there's that element. Um, maybe Councillor Lark will come out and, and, and make it clear as to why he felt he ought to have abstained. At this point, I believe he has not done so. And of course, that gives rise to the speculation as to as to why the Captain Cook statue in Yarra that was uh, vandalised, the council is reportedly considering scrapping that statue. That's getting some attention in the mm -hmm. media. Some saying if you do that, the vandals win. You would support that view, Julie? Ah, uh, not sure. I don't know. Where I, I don't know On the where fence? I sit this one. On the pedestal? Uh, on the fence, on the fence. This mm. is this is a very emotive kind of issue. And, look, uh, Yarra will make the right decision, I'm sure. They will they will take it and they will debate it and uh, they will no doubt come up with um, a solution. And it's yeah. I just don't think I can really comment on which way I would go with this one. It's a really, really difficult issue yeah. for the yeah. council because it is so emotive yeah. i think it's i think firstly i mean it's sad that it's come to this with you know repeated vandalism of a monument but at the end of the day i i think council um you know i appreciate council not wanting you know the citizens of yarra to continually have to fork out money to upkeep something that's continually vandalized so so you know there's a a point, I guess, where council says, you know, we we just can't afford to um, be be spending more and more money where where there's you know yeah. um, m other other needs. So it's not necessarily saying we don't want this statue. It's it's responding to a situation. Perhaps there's another council out there who feels that you know they like the monument and mm. um, and and uh, their their citizens might be um, more 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 happy for it to be there. But I think. I understand the response. Um, Councillor Stephen Jolly, I think, came as someone who's come out publicly and said, "Look, we just can't afford to have to fix this statue, it, and I don't know what it costs, but it's not the first time it's been vandalised." Oh, yeah. And um, so, you know, if we just kept every, you know, every few months spending money on it, um, at what point do we say? council have um you know need need to actually make a tough call and I, I i think it's probably come to that point now all right here's a question that we might need to devote uh more time to tony julie should councils be using ratepayers funds to sponsor sporting clubs i don't know if you've seen what's happening in yes, Parramatta. Yes. 
big sponsorship deal between the council there and the Parramatta Eels. It was meant to be apparently over three years as much as two and a half million dollars or 2.4. It's been watered down a bit. It's still 1.1 million over three years. That's after a backlash as to the uh, the value of spending that sort of money on a sporting club sponsorship. This is the NRL club, the the Eels. Um, what do we think about this? Yeah, uh, I see. I see the 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 council logo is not going to be on the Parramatta Eels top anymore, Chris and Julie. Only on the women's team, I believe. Not the okay. men's. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. look, um, I think there are it, we're in difficult, tough financial times for councils, and it becomes difficult sometimes then to justify these sponsorship decisions in that environment. So, um, I understand why perhaps the funding has been wound down. Um, we have teams that are really closely associated sometimes with areas like the AFL team in Geelong is oh. very closely associated with the city of greater Geelong. I don't believe there's a formal sponsorship arrangement currently in place there. Um, Western United, the A-League football club have a, certainly have some sort of partnership with Wyndham city council in relation to constructing new stadiums. And um, I think Wyndham's heavily involved um, they so, are, but that's very that's very different, isn't it? That's mm. about infrastructure development, economic generation, mm. uh, all those sorts of issues. Uh, this one's slightly different. Yeah, I, I think it might be at a, in a sometimes in a regional context where a, a sporting club brings particular um, investment into the town, and council might be might see it as part of its core operations to you know encouraging that economic development. There might be strong arguments for this, but I think, again, in that, in these tough financial times, I think there's a much less likelihood we'll see councils going down these sponsorship paths. Yeah, so it's it's a bit of a vexed issue. I, I've got an opinion here that it's probably not the space that councils should be putting their money into when things are really tight. And on that note, uh, Tony and Julie, the, the government has announced this week in New South Wales that there will be a full review of the financial model for councils in that state. IPART is running that. It's looking into the whole system, um, whether it delivers any meaningful change. I don't know. There's an excellent article from the Mandarin that looks at some of the analysis and the motivations behind this. But I imagine every other state, including Victoria, Julie, will be watching this with great interest. I think so, Chris. Um, you know, it's... It's something that's probably really well overdue, um, and I, I think we can only learn from from these kinds of reviews. So, yeah, um, great. Let's let's monitor it and report back. Of course, New South Wales has had rate pegging in for a long period, oh, much longer yeah. than it has been in uh, Victoria. So, on that level, I'm sure Victoria will be watching it very closely. So, some underlying messages, though, here, Tony, as you and I were discussing off here about perhaps where the government sees this going. Yeah, it does. It does seem that uh, the men's government up there is is really um, the theme is you know councils. You need to look beyond um, rates as your ongoing revenue source. Um, mm. Give close scrutiny to your expenditure and look for other revenue sources beyond rates. That seems to be the theme um, that that the government are pushing with council, and um, be interested to see whether this model review. Um, you know, sheds light on what some of those other other revenue sources might be, because presumably they're talking about things like fines and and other charges, yeah. rather than councils going down some entrepreneurial route. So mm -hmm. you know, I've, I think councils have um, typically been quite exhaustive in looking at their their funding and um, their expenditure. I think that's right. So as we say, we'll watch that very closely. Uh, before we wrap up, I have to note this. We we spoke about it late last year. A councillor at King Island, uh, which is uh, technically Tasmania, uh, was removed from office for missing three meetings in a row. She had not requested a leave of absence and nobody put one in for her, it should be said. The reason she missed the meetings, she was caring for her husband who had brain cancer. He's very sadly since passed away. Um, she renominated for the position that had been vacated under the legislation and has got it back unopposed. This is extraordinary, isn't it, that a system can give you a result like this? 
It is. And, you know, it could happen in Victoria. I was thinking mm. about it and think, you know, yeah. under Section 35, you know, when you cease to hold office because you've been absent from four or more council meetings without that leave of absence, well, um, you're not um, ineligible. It's not as though, you know, you're an undischarged bankrupt or, you know, you're working as an mm. MP or for a minister or something like that, that you're not allowed to be a councillor. You're simply, the seat's vacant. And presumably, if you just nominate at the next election and win, or in this case was not opposed, um, then you mm -hmm. can take your seat once again. And and look, um, given what we know about the facts, it seems mm -hmm. like it's the right result. It seems yeah. that the counsellor in question, Sabrina Laidler is her name. Mm -hmm. um, her circumstances have clearly changed. Um, she's no longer, you know, looking after you know, that tragic situation, looking after a terminally ill husband um, has changed now. So she's absolutely able to, you know, focus on council once again. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, I think there's probably, it's only a small community on King Island yeah. and they're probably quite sympathetic to her situation. You know, it's quite a um, distressing situation for her. So they've probably gone, yeah, look, give her another chance. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, there's really good circumstances why she just couldn't, you know, couldn't attend the council meeting. Yeah. So it's a forgiving community. It's a lovely place. Yes. I've got to say, you can fly too from Moorabbin Airport down to King Island and oh. have some time down there, and it's amazing. And the the crayfish is fantastic to die for. I thought so, the cheese was particularly tip. special, isn't it? The oh, cheese? yeah, well, cheese is good too. <laughs> but you know, you it's a it's a lovely, lovely place. So get yourself down to King Island. It's there a great you go. Place There's your your travel recommendation for this week from <laughs> uh, from Julie's Travel Service uh, yes. in the UK. Now, harking back to that New South Wales review and uh, some of those underlying motivations that Tony has uh, pinpointed, the UK government has come out quite very clearly and said uh, that it, its councils should be looking at selling public assets to try and address their public shortfalls, about £23 billion worth. Some say this is just a fire sale and it's not going to address long-term financial pressures. But there you go, Julie, your favourite uh, news source, the UK. Councils <laughs> there are doing it really tough and they're lining up their assets to try and uh, boost the bottom line. Oh, I know. I was just a bit, I was a bit shocked at this, but not I suppose in a way that I thought that would be the last resort, surely. Um, so I thought, is it really that bad that they've gone to the last resort of selling assets or is it easier for them to take on that option um, of selling assets? I don't know. Um, I'm not too sure what the situation is really with, with you know, why they made that decision. But um, Well, more know, and more of them are declaring, more and more it. of them are declaring effective bankruptcy, basically. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I suppose if you're declaring bankruptcy and you've got assets, then I suppose that is what you would do as a business. You would sell off assets, but it's, you know, selling off swimming pools and mm. civic halls and stuff like that. You know, you just think, well, where's the buyer's market with some of that stuff? Um, you know, maybe there That's are cool. private mm. industries that would take on those kind of buildings and convert them or whatever. Um, possibly, possibly they would do. Um, yeah, look, it's 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 smells like desperation to me. Yeah, thinking. Uh, speaking of things that smell, before we wrap up, uh, Tony, uh, is public urination a form of littering? Do you oh. think <laughs> that it struck? That was very interesting. That story. So, uh, um, come, was it decorum? Is that the name of the? Yeah, council? interesting we, name, isn't it? Decorum <laughs> Borough Council yeah, in Hartford. a lot of decorum oh. being showed by some of the yeah. people, but. Um, Look, and so, so, folks, this is a story about weeing in the countryside, apparently. So we're not talking about, you know, people doing this against a public building, you know, a building in the middle on the, of On the high street. On the high street. <laughs> um, no. But local laws officers, apparently, according to the story, have been, you know, um, parked in byways and jumping out um, uh, at, at travellers who have been um, caught short on their sort of country <laughs> journey and um, finding them with littering. Um, mm. That seems an unusual approach. I think they probably need to back off and chill a little. Um, we've probably all been in this situation at some time or had young children, you know, in the car and having to stop and these sorts of things. So, um, yeah, I think there's a major difference between what might have happened in the countryside and, and what might happen late at night in our 
unfortunately in in, in our um sort of entertainment areas often where people are, people are doing the wrong thing so um yeah, yeah not I liking this story that. that was a big issue in london when i was there the yeah. urination in streets in central london and westminster city council embraced that and looked at solutions for trying to address that issue because it was antisocial behavior they called it and they put in place um, mechanisms to minimise that antisocial behaviour at night because people were distressed because people were urinating in their mm. in their doorways in the central Soho. So they um, installed pop-up urinals that were developed by the Germans, I think, um, and they would pop up at night and help uh, those revellers coming out of the uh, the licensed premises desperate for one too many point <laughs> for some relief yeah. um and it was very very effective um so you know it's about being creative in solutions so um but you know we know in australia you know it's a vast country uh countryside um but i'm always really impressed with how easily accessible toilet blocks are across our country areas and <laughs> when you go through towns there's always a reliable public toilet that the council maintains and i just want to finish on that thank you councils for those fantastic public toilets neither of you have answered my question is it littering <laughs> is it littering no no, I don't reckon it is. So this, <laughs> this council... is going to be a high court challenge to this. That's what I want. <laughs> this council is is holding firm, uh, even though it's apparently got legal advice saying its position is questionable. And I've got to say, one of the fines uh, that was reported has already been withdrawn because it's been shown that the act of littering in this case uh, was not actually witnessed by. The council officer in question. Oh so, boy! Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so stay, stay tuned. We cover all the big issues here on uh, TGU. <laughs> I think that's all we've got for you this week. Mercifully, some might say. Yeah. Back in the swing of things, Tony. How's your week looking ahead? Oh yeah, lo lo lots on. Um, and uh, I'm participating in some of those forums around um, conduct matters, and then um. I won't join you next Friday, folks. I'm off on a plane to Mildura oh. and I'm spend some oh. time with the Mildura councillors and council team up there. So that'll be that'll be fun and no doubt nice and warm and beautiful up there, Mildura and oh, the Murray. You. So, Julie, we're going to have to find someone else to fill Tony's seat next week. What are we going to I do? I think we do need we'll, to. We'll work on that. Talk about and, that. Uh, and uh, you have a good week too, Julie. Look forward to having yeah. you back on uh, the show. And we yeah. might uh, just draw a line under it there because uh, I was going to try and keep our episodes a little bit shorter in 2024, but so far we're failing. Uh, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> uh, th thanks for joining us again for TGU from VLGA Connect. Don't forget uh, the Fast Track Day from VLGA is coming up on the 15th of March. Terrific lineup of speakers, including Cos Samaras. You can find out more on the VLGA's website and registrations are now open. All right, that's TGU for the 2nd of Feb 2024 and we'll uh, see you again very soon. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.